Hello, everyone, and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messi, and I'm here at the Naval Museum of Manitoba at HMCS Chippewa in Winnipeg, having a look at a fascinating piece of early 20th century maritime rescue technology. This is what's known as a Carly raft or Carly float. And this is a very common type of life raft carried aboard many merchant and naval vessels from the First World War to the Second World War. Now, this was patented in 1903 by one Horace Carley. And what's interesting is that he really didn't get into the maritime safety business or even the inventing business until very late in life. Now, Horace Carley was born on July 22nd, 1838 in Sherborne, Massachusetts. As a teenager, he served aboard whaling ships, which may have inspired him to start thinking about maritime safety technology. Uh, he later served in the Civil War with the 30th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry, though he was invalided out of the service in 1862. However, immediately afterwards, he re-enlisted in the Navy and served for the rest of the war aboard the armed schooner Thomas Woodard. Now, for the rest of his life, Carly spent most of his time working as an interior decorator and a traveling musician. And it wasn't until he was in his 60s that a tragic event led to him creating his most famous invention. So on July 4th, 1898, the French liner La Bourgogne was sailing in heavy fog off Cape Sable in Nova Scotia when she was accidentally rammed by the British sailing vessel Cromartyshire. Now, as a result of this collision, all of the lifeboats on the starboard side of La Bourgogne were destroyed. And meanwhile, all of the remaining lifeboats on the port side proved very slow and cumbersome to launch from their davits. Now, to make things worse, the crew of La Bourgogne acted in a very selfish and unprofessional manner. Not only did they not distribute any life preservers to the passengers, but they also got into the lifeboats first and actually started beating the passengers with oars to stop them from getting in. And as a result of this, only 70 of the some 500 passengers aboard were rescued, whereas half of the crew survived. Now, as most of the passengers aboard were Americans, this tragedy caused an uproar in the United States, doubly so when the French government decided to cover up the entire incident. Now, in the wake of this disaster, the family of one Mr. Pollock, who died aboard the ship, offered a $20,000 prize for improvements to lifeboat technology, and Horace Carley decided to have a go at winning this prize. So in 1903, he was awarded a patent for his life raft design, and he formed the Carly Life Float Company in Cambridgeport, Massachusetts. Now, unfortunately, at first, the company didn't do very well due to competition from other manufacturers and a series of patent disputes. But their fortunes turned around with the outbreak of the First World War in 1914, when they were contracted to build rafts for the navies of several nations, including Britain, Canada, Italy, and Russia. And in addition to the original factory in Cambridgeport, Carly floats were also manufactured under license by Knott's Industry Limited of Somerset, England, and three Australian companies, FG Care and Company Limited, Madigan and Barrel Limited, and ACI Engineering Limited. Though Horace Carly wouldn't live to see much of this success as he died on Christmas Day 1918 at the age of 80. Now let's actually have a look at this design. This might look like a regular inflatable raft, but it's actually not. The core of the system consists of a large diameter piece of copper or steel tube bent into an oval and completely sealed. And on the inside are a series of baffles to divide the tube into watertight compartments. And this makes the raft very robust and means that even if you puncture a couple of the compartments, it will still float. And now this core is covered in a buoyant layer of kapok or cork, and then finally an outer covering of doped canvas to waterproof it. So the basic idea here was that the Carly float required no specialized equipment to store and launch, unlike lifeboats, which needed storage cradles and davits. You could lash a Carly float to basically any available surface on a ship and launch it by simply cutting away the lashings and throwing it into the water and it would float stably in either orientation. Now, this particular model, the smallest, has a simple rope floor on it. However, the larger models would have had a wood lattice floor that could actually be lowered on a net of webbing to allow survivors to stand on the inside with their bodies immersed in water. Meanwhile, more survivors could cling to the outside using these rope handles. 
And Carly floats came in 11 different sizes, which could accommodate anywhere between 6 and 67 people. And ships typically carried a number of different sizes, with the smaller models being nested inside the larger ones in order to save space. And the floats were often equipped with a variety of survival equipment, including oars, boat hooks. The larger models had rope ladders to allow you to climb in more easily. Some had calcium phosphide flares, which automatically ignited on contact with seawater and gave off a very bright white light. And most also carried a box of emergency rations. And you can see this particular float has its original rations intact. And these would last a single person around 50 days. Now, while the Carly float was a market improvement over earlier lifeboats, it did suffer from one fundamental flaw, which is that it really didn't protect its occupants very much from the elements. Now, when this was invented, the idea is that it would provide flotation and prevent the passengers of a sunken ocean liner from drowning for the hour or two it would take for them to be rescued. Unfortunately, in wartime, this wasn't always possible. Convoys that were plying the North Atlantic during the First and Second World Wars were under strict orders not to slow down to pick up survivors of any ships that were sunk by U-boats or surface raiders. And this makes sense because this would make those other ships highly vulnerable to being sunk themselves. And what this meant was that any survivors who managed to reach a Carly float would have to wait a very long time, sometimes on the order of days or weeks, to be rescued. And if you were immersed in the frigid waters of the North Atlantic, your survival time is measured in hours. However, this doesn't necessarily mean that the Carly float was a death trap. For example, on November 23rd, 1942, the merchant ship SS Ben Lomond was torpedoed in the South Atlantic and sunk with all hands except for one, a mess steward named Poon Lin, who managed to make his way onto a small Carly float. And Poon Lin turned out to be very resourceful. For example, he removed the cloth covering from his life preserver and used it to make a canopy over the raft, both to protect himself from the sun and to collect rainwater. And he managed to stretch his 50-day ration by using it to catch fish. So he'd use bits of biscuit to catch small fish and then use those fish as bait to catch larger fish. He would then salt those fish using salt water in, or that was around him, and then dry it in the sun to make a jerky to preserve it. And using these techniques, he managed to survive an incredible 133 days until he was finally discovered alive off the coast of Brazil. And he was later awarded the British Empire Medal by King George VI for his determination and ingenuity. Carly floats were also involved in one of the greatest mysteries of the Royal Australian Navy. So on November 19th, 1941, the Leander-class light cruiser HMAS Sydney was sunk with all hands in an engagement with the German auxiliary cruiser Cormoran off the coast of Western Australia. Now, the crew of the Cormoran mostly managed to escape and get into lifeboats and were later captured by the Australians, though they were very uncooperative in interrogations and interrogators were only able to partially piece together what happened during the battle. Now, no trace of the Sydney was ever found other than a single life preserver and a heavily damaged Carly float that was recovered around a week later. And given the disparity in survival between the two ships, this led to a number of conspiracy theories, such as that the Cormoran violated the rules of war by luring in the Sydney without raising a battle flag, that a Japanese submarine was actually involved, and that the crew of the Cormoran machine gunned the survivors of the Sydney in the water so as to leave no witnesses, though none of these theories have ever been substantiated. However, three months after the sinking, a Carly float bearing a body washed up on the shore of Christmas Island in the South Pacific. But unfortunately, the body was very decomposed and bore no identifiable markings or effects, and so its identity remained a mystery for nearly 80 years. And it was only very recently, in 2021, that DNA analysis finally identified the body as belonging to able seaman Thomas Wellesby Clark, of HMAS Sydney, and so he remains the only crew member of Sydney ever to be recovered. So while the Carly float was one of the most widely issued life rafts of this period, it wasn't the only one. Some of the other rescue devices used by the Royal Navy and the US Navy around this time included the Denton float, which was patented by Geoffrey Price Denton of the Royal Artillery, and was basically a square ring of cork with rope handles that you could cling to. 
There was also the Spanner Raft, patented by Edward Frank Spanner of the United States in 1940. And the Royal Navy also used something called a night life buoy, which was rather interesting. This consisted of a light metal frame with four hollow copper spheres as floats and a set of automatic calcium phosphide flares. And these were intended for use in a man overboard situation at night. So this would be thrown out into the water, the flares would automatically ignite, and the man overboard would be able to see it and swim over and be hauled aboard. And apparently these also included something called refreshments, which are basically a rum ration to warm you up. Although, of course, this doesn't work that way. Uh, when you drink alcohol, you actually lowers your body temperature. But at the same time, I guess it would be a great comfort if you just risk drowning. Anyways, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and a huge thank you to the Naval Museum of Manitoba for allowing me to come here and film this interesting piece. I have a bunch of other interesting things around the museum that hopefully I will be covering in future videos, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.